rights activist. He's taking calls. Lucy called right before the break, asked about some organization with Herm Cain. Lucy, sorry, you don't know that organization. I'm just going to move it along. But you were talking about, she was talking about the the demonstrations and the governor. What What is your response to what she said there? I think that is a good point, is that um, rather than meet with us, the governor spent over a million dollars um, to hire d hundreds of troopers to monitor the Capitol and to make mass arrests of over 200 young people simply trying to meet with him. And I think he could have solved a lot of issues if he would have came down the steps and had a conversation about what was a national dialogue around race and racial injustice in our nation. And so I, I hope that Governor Lee learned from that experience. And, and next time um, young people are sitting on a pavement for 62 days and want to talk to him, he might just come out and solve some of those issues by having a conversation. Because um, no matter if we like it or not, he's the governor. Governor of every Tennessean, and no matter if he likes it or not, he's the, he's the governor of every Tennessean, regardless of party, regardless of age or race or gender. He is the Tennessee governor, and I think that he needs to um, realize that that we are all, you know, it's a public service position. It's not a king, but it's someone who is a public servant. And I hope that every elected official um, will remember that. I don't think he thought that if he did that, it would have really solved anything. That that would have just given more attention to it all, or something, or maybe there would have been a big, you know. Well, I don't know. He didn't even meet with the Black Caucus. So it wasn't just us, but I don't know if you recall last year, the Black Caucus said, well, can we meet on behalf of these young people outside? He wouldn't even meet with the Black Caucus or their chair. And so they were offended. He wouldn't meet with the clergy who came down there. He wouldn't meet with us. And so I think it's a pattern of behavior um, that people who disagree with the, the dominant party are ostracized, whether it was us, whether it's people like Gloria Johnson, who was kicked out of her legislative office and, and put in a closet and taken off committees because she had a different opinion, whether it's people like the top immunologist in our state who was fired because she had a different opinion, whether it's people like the judge who they try to kick off because she voted, she, she ruled that we should use absentee voting during a pandemic. So whoever has a different opinion is, is treated as you do not deserve a voice in the Capitol. They try to kick the entire historical commission out because they voted to remove Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so Joey Hensley filed a bill to get rid of them. So whoever has a different opinion is, 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 is silence. And that doesn't sound like democracy to me, no matter where you are. I don't think that's, that's the, the future we want for Tennessee. Let's go to Reverend Fuzz. Hello, Reverend Fuzz. Hey, Dan. Good evening, Benson. Hey, Reverend Fuzz. I'm very <laughs> proud to see somebody young taking this up couple questions put before you tonight like what's next i'm glad to see you know statues and stuff like that symbolic stuff but moving the statue is not going to get any kids through college it's not going to get health care for anybody i could ask you jefferson street is named after Thomas Jefferson. Wow, and you know where that street is? Or think about, you got John Lewis Avenue so fast, well, you know how long it took before this city would name a street after Dr. Martin Luther King? Uh, does he, he's got a part, a little bit of Charlotte named after him. That happened just a couple of years ago, 15 something years after his death what's happening in Nashville. So we talk about what's next. What do you think about, and you've already been a part of that movement, like voter suppression? Or what about Tennessee State University being owed a half billion dollars from the state? Do you think that deserves or rate some kind of protest um, where kids could get an education in this city? What how much difference that would make. And then finally, I don't want you to be discouraged. I remember in 1994, somebody told me, Reverend, this state will never allow, no, this state will never ban smoking in the state capitol because of the money it makes for cigarettes. So don't be discouraged about that. But what about some things that have more substance than a statue. I know that statue okay. was... All right, let's, okay. let's talk about that, Reverend Fuzz. Thank you. Thank you. So you heard that question. Yeah. What, do you, what do you say? Yeah. I think we got this question three times. But <laughs> first of all, I want to say, Reverend Fuzz, I'm so glad that you are healthy and doing well. I think a lot of people in the city um, are glad that you're doing a lot better and we've been thinking about you. But I would say, as I said, that the statue was the easy part, that um, 
that the monument represents policies and symbols, and that the real fight now continues to make real the promise of a multiracial democracy. And that does translate to voting. That does translate to challenging voter suppression. But I would say, just like it was th those colored and white signs were a symbol, it didn't change life in the South, but those young people said, we're going to go after a symbol. Because what big of a difference does it make to sit at a lunch counter? They said, you know, if you can't afford to eat at the lunch counter. And so we know that this is the easy part, just like it was the first step to remove the colored and white signs. To me, this was a symbol saying that blacks are separate and unequal in the Capitol. We removed it, and now we must continue to say, let's take down every policy and symbol this represents. Um, ironically, the statue was put up 10 years after Dr. King was assassinated in Tennessee, um, in Memphis. And so we know that everything he came to Tennessee for, um, for jobs and justice with the um, sanitation worker strike in Memphis persists, that we too many people make 725, too many people cannot vote because of felony disenfranchisement, one in five black men in Tennessee, we have 280,000 Tennesseans without health care. All these are struggles that we're connecting. And I, I'm someone who believes in the power of intersectionality, believes in the power of connecting race with economic justice, um, with gender justice and environmental justice. And so I'm excited, as I said, to travel the state. And we're going to talk about these issues and we're going to continue to move. Um, this was not a stopping point by any means for me or for anyone I was associated with. Um, but to me, it is something that we should celebrate um, as a victory because we don't do that enough in the movement. We don't celebrate victories. And I think that discourages people and gets them to burn out. But we, we put in work and we achieve something. And I, I commend all the people who came down to the Capitol, um, young people, old people, clergy, whoever it is, we did this together. And I think we, all of you should be commended. Let's go to Caleb. Hello, <laughs> Caleb. Yes. Go right ahead. Hey, how's it going? How's it going, Justin? Um, so I've been watching Justin uh, for some years now. It's been absolutely remarkable about the stuff he's been doing. Um, I think he is a step in the, uh, or a, you know, a step in the right direction as far as uh, advocating and activism. Um, one thing I really wanted to say was it's not about um, white, black. It's about whether you're or not you're a decent person and whether or not you're a racist. Um, I think there is a clear line between um, racism and people who just want to have this conversation. And I think all too often we're seeing our our local governments, our state government, blurring the lines. And I think it's remarkable that in any case, you know, what happens with our, you know, our black brothers and sisters, that they're put on the back burner when it comes to, you know, white Tennesseans everywhere. Um, I think it's not okay to sit there and say that, um, you know, well, this person had a black boyfriend or, you know, talking about the, the conversation with the other caller, but people need to realize tokenism is racism as well. And I, I wouldn't say it's a woke community. I would say it's more so people realizing that, you know, they're, they're you know, black people, our, our black brothers and sisters are people too, and they need to be thought of as well. And all too often, they don't have that representation in the state, especially a very majority white state. Um, so I, I really think that what Justin is doing is really great, and thank you so much, Justin. Thanks. Thank um, you. A quick comment to that, you wanna comment? Yeah, I think that's an important thing to say is that, um, there is a battle against white supremacy in the state, and it's also hurting white people. White supremacy hurts white people. And I think you had a professor at Vanderbilt write a book, Dying of Whiteness, when we look at things like Medicaid expansion, where people are saying, we don't want health care because it's associated with a black president, and it's disproportionately poor rural white people who need this if they want to keep their rural hospitals open, if they want to, you know, two, every day two Tennesseans die from lack of health care. So these are things that, we, that, ex, that transcend race but also have a racial justice lens that we have to put on them to say why is it that they're playing this divide and conquer that they've done since the 60s the civil rights movement. Um, they've used race to divide and conquer us and so we cannot ignore race but we have to let people know that we that it's hurting all of us, and that if we if we talk the truth about these policies of denying living wages, denying voting rights, denying criminal justice, like you go to the jails, it's black, brown, and poor white people in the jails. Every time I go to court, that's who's in line. And so I think we have to talk about why is that, and and, and kind of look at a fusion movement, because I think that's the thing that's always scared, um, particularly the South, and that has changed the South, is when we, we transcend these, these barriers that they put up, and, and make it about this fusion movement. Um, that's what we saw during Reconstruction. That's how my university, Fisk University, was founded from this fusion movement and this vision. And so I think that um, it, it's the hope and it's, the, it's kind of the roadmap for the future. We'll take a break, come back, continue the discussion right after this. Thanks.